Welcome back to History for Fools. History for Fools. With Bush Escobar and Felipe Esparza. This podcast is about history of anything. We're not historians here. We have, we have no MAs, PAs. I have half a GED. I just have a GE. A lot of BS, though. A lot yeah, of, a lot, lot of, of B- BS. A lot of BS. And um, we're not going to just talk about one specific subject. We're going to take on different subjects. So if you're listening to right now, we're, we're talking about stand-up comedy right now. If you're listening to it later on, well, I don't know what the hell we're talking about. Yeah, it, but it, it, it's <laughs> most certainly, it will not be stand-up comedy. So this is like our take on the history of stand-up comedy and, and comedians. The last time we were here, we left off with um, Parker Carcass and Joe Lewis and how vaudeville was done. We talked about vaudeville was vaudeville done. Vaudeville was ending. And we talked about uh, the last episode how the guy um, the guy who came up with uh, Orphan, what was his name? Um... Well, the guy that booked all the Orpheum shows and all the clean shows, Keith Albee. Keith 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 so the Albie. downfall of all the vaudeville shows was when the theater owners decided to use all that money and make real, real lavish studios. Right. Like if you walk into a theater right now, whether it's the Warfield or the Fox, the Orpheum, or many of the theaters that I him mean, and I have performed on. I mean, even if you go to like, dude, we're, we're going to be doing, and we've done... The Fox Theater in Visalia. Yeah. And it's a small town in Central California. If you're not from California, you probably never even heard of it. And even if you're in California. But when you walk into this theater. It's elegant. It's so extravagant and so beautiful. And at the last stab to like kind of get people to come back to the theaters, the Keith Alvey circuit decided to put tons of cash into all these theaters to make them lavish and beautiful but at the same time you know prohibition is is coming is is ending and it's crushing it yeah there's no money to go to theaters now there's no and there's no need to you're not gonna cover that cost too because these like put it this way we've been to a lot of comedy clubs and little money is spent on bathrooms Right, and um, there's no need for or it. our faster exit, or or getting someone to plan out an exit or a meet and greet. Well, all that all that stuff is that they expect the comedian to do it. So instead of fixing the the bathrooms and making better dressing rooms or better lit dressing rooms or fixing the plumbing, this guy decided to put a silk dress over a pig. Right, and um. All these theaters have big million dollar chandeliers. I don't care what theater you yeah, go to. Yeah, I mean, well, you could go to them now. I mean, I think everybody has one in a town nearby. Like, I mean, because these were in like small town America. And so. Small town, dude. Like that small town we went to in, um, in Joliet. Yeah, like in Joliet, Illinois. And there were um, a lot of comedians there. There was that statue of Charlie Chaplin right, right. outside. And then one of Groucho Marx. That's right. That's right. Do you remember? When we did, I did that theater, and there was a lot of older people there. And we'll give it up for the ushers here, man. Some of them slept with, with Jack Benny. Yeah, there's a statue Jack of Jack Benny. Benny. Okay. So the, that theater we were at in Joliet was built for Jack That's Benny. That's right. I heard and, about that. And um, there was a statue of Jack Benny, and I made a reference to Do one you- of the ushers. I said, give it up for some of these ladies here, man. They slept with Jack Benny. <laughs> no one got the reference. Do you remember the name of the theater, by chance? It was called the, um, the Joliet Theater. Do you think? I don't though, the name. Do you think something else? Play, I I didn't think about this till right now, um, because like a theater, you go and you sit down and you watch a show on stage, and you buy your drinks first, and then you go sit down and 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 watch the show. And now you know, like even with the clubs now, but with the clubs back then, you had a waiter or a cocktail waitress that was constantly bringing drinks, which ups the amount of money that's coming into. Uh, like a club or a or a like um i mean a, a an event so there's not as much money going into the theaters because people are just coming in and sitting down whereas a club now booze is legal because prohibition's over there's tons of more money going into it plus um a theater loses out because people have dinner outside the theater right they have cocktail drinks 
outside the theater. Right. And I don't think the, some of these theaters brought in a bar till after Prohibition. So Prohibition hits, and there's no money. So a lot of these comics are performing now at speakeasies. A lot of the, and, and some of these speakeasies, put it this way, Prohibition brought in diversity too. It sure did. Because before, if you wanted to see a black performer, you wouldn't see them perform in white places. But pro, because of prohibition, you know, they allow that they allow that to happen. So you're watching comics, black comedians, and black performers performing in shows with other white performers. And uh, it was probably the first time they were they were allowing gay clubs too. The the other thing too was like this is added like the other thing is there's like an added element now to stand up comedy that's never been before and that is that we're primarily dealing with gang members like mobsters so it's no mobsters run all the clubs they run all the clubs um there's like a couple stories and and there's the one about Joey Lewis um where he's working for one club and he's also working for another club and they're owned by two different factions of the same mob which is weird and they tell these guys hey they tell this guy Joey Lewis you can't go work there you work for us. And he's like, fuck you. I'm going to go work for these guys, too. I'm going to go make my money. And I got mouths to feed. They got mouths to feed. And they send, like, three guys to go kill him. They fuck him up. They beat the shit out of him. They said that he... They he, cut his throat pretty much, and he couldn't talk normally. He they, had to relearn really how to they talk. They cut his throat, and they pulled his tongue out. But they also beat him so hard that his teeth were shining through his, 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 his cheek. Um, but it did, and this is a testament to people who like this, who, I mean, Joey Lewis ended up with a very, very successful career, but it took him three years to learn how to talk again. Yes. Back. Um, when, when, when that went to the hospital and the police spoke to him, he never like, he never rat, he never, um, said who hit him. You know, he never, never uh, he, he never, he, he never um, gave names. And, um, later on it was known that it was Sam G and Kana. And, um, uh, but... He, ended, he got the respect from all the mobsters that he ended up working all the clubs, not just the one that he was not allowed to go yeah, to. Yeah, because he wasn't going to rat, and they had a lot more respect for him for that. And also, this is different now because before you're performing in theaters, so it's, 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 like, there, it's like 300 people there, 400. It's not as intimate as the 300-seat club with tables, candles. Now it's more personal. Right. You know? So now, if you now you people, comedians are talking to the audience for the first time, you know, in a theater you really can't do that because you have your set act, and don't forget, and if you go over your time, here comes the hook. So yeah. you really, you really can't go off character. Right. So Milton Burrow, he's he he starts talking smack to somebody, and they tell him no. Hey, be careful. Be careful what you say to me. That's right. And that guy stabs them with a fucking fork. Huh? Yeah, he sits down with the... They go, hey, they go to the green room. So he gets off stage. And this is another element that we, we don't have to deal with in our time. That's what you think, bro. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's a couple times where people have tried to take a few swings at me. But um, nothing as bad as this where you have actual gangsters that run this stuff that are sitting in the club. And then you got Milton Berle making jokes about this guy's wife. He says some shit. This guy can't take That's a joke. That's right. He made fun of his wife. He made fun of his wife. And he stabbed Milton Berle in the face. Milton yes, Berle had to get six stitches. The cool thing that I liked about that story was that they, that right away the, um, the mob or the syndicate or whatever the fuck they called him then, um, like took him to their own doctor. He took him to their own doctor. He was like, they took care of him. They got him stitched up. And they're like, don't say fucking shit. And you can keep your job. Yeah, man. Lucky with a comedian, man. He don't sing with the canaries. Do you do you think, though, like, this is the other thing, too, is as we're going over this stuff, we're also, what I've realized, too, is we're also talking about the trajectory of the modern day comedy club and where we're at now because it did used to be in theaters and we've worked theaters before and it's fun to do theaters and I have a little good time in theaters but the comedy club is almost scientifically perfect for stand-up comedy the low ceilings the small tables with the chairs grouped up low stage if you go into any comedy like real comedy club in America you know um, you're gonna find a low stage low ceilings 
And I think that had a lot to do with that time and era because we were starting to discover that this could be its own thing. And now again, we're in an era where stand-up comedy doesn't have an opener, a feature, and a headliner. Like you have a, a singer come in, you have a stand-up comic, a fucking juggler, like a bunch of different acts. They were still, they were still doing this in the clubs. Right. And um, getting back to um, dealing with the mob and all that, um, b back in 19, I think I would say... Before I started, I started doing stand up. I think it was '94, probably or '93. There was a room that Willie Barcena, comedian Willie Barcena, 14 to night shows. Look it up. And um, hell yeah, he um, he told me that there was a guy inside the club, and it was like a biker bar, okay. biker cholo bar. It was it was in uh, on Almani Avenue by Pet Boys in Monterey, Monterey Park, and it was called Tequilas. I think. <laughs> This is like a scene from a movie we're setting up. And um, <laughs> Willie Barcena said he was hosting, and his, fuck, and his fucking cholo, he, he he like, they start talking to him, right? As soon as they talked to him, he, 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 wanted, he lifted up his shirt, and he showed him his pistol. No way. Yeah. And then other comedians were like doing the, hey, man, there's a, couple, there's a pistol, the guy. There's a guy with a pistol in front of me. Be careful. Don't talk to him. <laughs> So the guy having his drinks, and he's brandishing his pistol, bro, to every time a comedian talks to him. so He just pulls his shirt up and shows a yeah. pistol. Yeah. So a really young Carlo Mencia is next, dog. And Carlo Mencia lives from that show. He could walk to his house because he lives in the Maravilla Projects. He could go over there and call 50 of his neighbors, bro, to go to that bar if and, he wants and to. fuck that fool up. Yeah, if he wants to. Oh, that guy probably from his neighborhood. So um, he, Carlo Monsieur tells that fool when he flashes his gun. These are Willie's words. What you going to do, fucking stupid idiot? You going to shoot me in front of all your witnesses? <laughs> you have enough bullets for everybody, stupid? You're fucking small time, eh? No Then everybody shit. laughs. Wait, Willie says this to the guy. No, Carlo, Carlo Mencia says this. Carlos Carlo Mencia. Mencia says this to the guy. Yeah. No You're a shit. fucking idiot, eh? He, you gonna kill your father? You witness this stupid? Oh my god! Yeah, and um, and um, the guy with the gun just started laughing, bro. And now uh, everybody started laughing, and that's it. He and broke. He got him. He broke the ice. He got him like that. He got him. Wow. Was, well, up there, man, I'm telling you, man. Sometimes the honesty is the best. Have you ever had a situation like that yourself, where there was someone in the crowd that was not liking anything, and bro, you, you turned them? A woman. You think, when I get heckled, it's usually a woman okay. that's drunk and it's always in a situation where... That's not typical. That was a, that it, there was something else before the comedy show <laughs> and it had to stop. Yes. Like some other fun where this woman was at had to stop abruptly and they, they have to do a comedy show now. Right. So I respect her for being upset. For being but upset. But don't take about it out on me, man. Yeah. Go talk to the guy that said, we're going to have a comedy show on her day. That's the thing is, as I was going through a lot of the stuff that, we, that we're reading about the history of comedy, there's so many things that I could correlate from then to today. Like, because uh, there's so many bar shows that you do. I don't think people understand how hard it is when you first get into comedy and you walk into. You're going to do this comedy show at fucking Joe's Bar, and Joe's Bar's got all these regulars that hang out from the neighborhood, and for the last 30 years, Joe's Bar has just had a jukebox. And some comic walked in the, like a week before and said, hey, we want to do a comedy show here. And then you show up not knowing any of this, and the crowd just absolutely fucking hates you because they're like not ready for comedy. Or you go to the comedy, sh you go to the comedy show, and you look around, and and you go, uh oh, what's going on, man? Uh, and you look, over, you start asking the manager. People are not gonna come in here expecting you to play pool and see them all covered up, right? Yeah, no, that's exactly what's gonna happen. That's exactly. Or when they come in to see the game, the best is when they either come in to see the game, and and they turn the TVs off. That's what happened to that lady. It was a Lakers playoff, and they turned the game off. And she was not happy, bro. About she it. was wearing a Laker hat. A Laker jersey. She That's was wearing spot, purple bro. purple shoes. She's ready to go get her free chili on and fucking watch the game. And they started the show, and a comedian before me, a ventriloquist, by the way, um, he, 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 he killed, right? 
And then she was yelling, boo, to me, right? Yeah. And I, cause that, uh, that I suck, man. And that um, the guy was better than me. He wins. You know, people don't know how to heckle comedians. Mm-hmm. So you yell, you yell out something else. That guy was better than you. He beat you. <laughs> he beat you. You know that? Like they turned it into a competition for you. And, you and sometimes you don't want to tell the lady, lady, if I really want to beat him, I'll tell him I'm not giving him a ride home. <laughs> If I really you don't to, know we drove here together. I really want to fuck his day up. I'll just tell him I'm not gonna give him a ride home tonight. So I, I told that I told that woman, "What did he win? You? Did you know I forfeit? <laughs> you can have. Hey, bro, you win, dog. You get her. <laughs> she goes, "Tell me exactly where the Lakers play at. Give me the address. You never been there, huh? <laughs> How you gonna wear clothes of stuff? You never been there." <laughs> Have you been? Is yeah, this, that's why I don't wear Hawaiian T-shirts. And I looked over at what's his name. <laughs> no way! Are you fucking serious, dude? I have to get a laugh, bro. Something gotta sacrifice somebody. You have to throw people under the bus. Well, we were talking about that. You gotta sacrifice. If you don't know how to sacrifice a friend for a laugh, you're not ready to be a a fucking yeah. right. Well, we were talking about that earlier today, where you asked me if I had ever bagged on a promoter. Uh, to the point of where they never talk to me again. And I've had to do that a couple times where I've had to throw someone under the bus in order to get the like crowd on my side. And it'll get them on my side, but now that fucking guy's never booking me again. But that's like that, that, that what happened to you with... Um... But see, like it's funny, man, how a, a promoter or a club owner might treat you really, really bad over the years, but you don't give up. You, they keep seeing your face, and they keep not liking you. Then one day, a big time comedian like Willie Barcena brings you up. Right. Yes. But that, did you ever talk about that somewhere on off on a, on a podcast or just off stage when um, that promoter told you not to be clean? Oh, the one over in Reno. Yes. Like when I first met him. No, I've never talked about that really. But I mean, I don't give a fuck about that guy anymore because he doesn't fuck me. But like he, um, yeah, I first rolled up and like he does the and he does it to everybody. You mean the Willie Barcena one, right? The Willie Barcena. But he, 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 but but this is like the history of comedy here, okay? But this correlates to what we're talking about because Keith Alby, one of those promoters, you know that he was like a, a when you talk about a gatekeeper. Just the guy that stands in front of the door and keeps you from going in. This guy is beyond that. Well, I he think- has people at the door not letting you in. No. Because he's the one that came out with that blue list. Oh, my God, bro. It's my So, like, he... Remember the blue list, bro? Yes. So, they had a blue list back in the day, and then they called it blue because they'd give you a blue envelope with your... Bad jokes. With your bad jokes that you're not supposed to do. My fucking envelope would have been purple, bro. My envelope would have been fucking black. <laughs> Like, dude, that's the thing is like, it still happens. And that's when I'm, as I'm reading these books and I'm going through all this information, I'm like, this shit still exists. Where someone still tries to push their agenda on you. It's fucking comedy. And he would go, oh, you need to be clean. You need to be clean. You need to be clean. And then he would have like fucking his bringers do dirty. And then he would tell. And so this one night we're in Reno and he has this. He's, you know, a lot of these guys, what they'll do is they'll go to different places and and they score an account, basically. Okay, I have this place and it's going to it's gonna bring me this much money. Like in the 80s, there was um, Bob Zaney, a great comic who started off when he was 14 years old. He used to cut grass in Pasadena in the valley. And then one day he, he was on a Tonight Show. He did stand-up comedy and he had a bunch of rooms all over America when comedy was hot, when the... During the comedy boom, there were all these. They, they were called the Bob Zany rooms. Is that where Zany's came from? Not Zany's. He was. He is Z A N Y. Oh, okay. And, right. and Zany is Z A N I S. I thought so too. I was like, whoa. So it got so big that he had to hire a secretary with an office to get all these phone calls from these promoters to book shows. So, in essence, Bob Zany was. Bonkers before bonkers. <laughs> because Bonkers really? Comedy Club 
doesn't work out out of a oh, out of a comedy. Would, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, he, he would he would he he would like some come some bonkers. They work out of hotels or they work out of a casino. Yes, but it's the same owner. Right. But Bob Zaney did that too. He'll go to, he'll go to Reno. Okay, you have one from comedy. We will have the Bob Zaney room here, and we'll have this and that. We'll have this and that that. You know, this is that. But that. it's at like Bill's bar in, yeah. the, in the back or something. Yeah, but he had, and if you worked all the Bob Zaney rooms, you right. were working. But Bob Zaney was not one of those guys, you know, that, oh, you got to be this, you got to be that. So Which, so these promoters have not changed. No, these hell people no. People have not changed. Because they do shit like that where they go, okay, we're going we're gonna to take this room and we're going to call it a club. And he got this huge, huge. Um, uh, casino that's off the freeway. Um, if you're coming from Northern California, you you'll see it. It's massive. It's it's like isolated. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but it's got everything. It's got a Cabela's. It's got like a Walmart. <laughs> it's got like oh, just laughing. Dude, it's got fucking everything, and it's got a casino. So this guy's really hyped about getting this, and he call you know he calls me up. He says you want to work with Willie. I said yeah. So I go and I'm like, man, I don't know why he's got Willie on the thing because he's really he expresses how much he wants you to be clean, and so I get away every once in a while with a f bomb or whatever, but he does generally want you to be clean. So he pulls Willie out, and Willie goes, and so me and Willie are just getting to know each other. We we kind of didn't get along at first. We started to become really good friends by the end of this trip. So this is the last show. And we're crossing each other's pathways in the hallway. Now, I have to sleep in this fucker's room. The promoter's, not Willie's. Willie got his own room. I have to sleep with the promoter who's got like a sleep apnea machine and he walks around in like jockey short, like jockey underwear. And a dog. Where you, yes, and the dog. But you can see his butt cheeks when he gets out of bed. And, and I was telling Willie about it. We're laughing. So we're crossing each other in the hallway and he goes, Hey, this fool really mean it when he says we got to be clean? I'm all... He does, he does, but if you're killing it, he, you, he tends to ignore it. And he goes, all right, if you're dirty, I'll be dirty. And I'm like, deal. And we shake hands in the hallway. <laughs> and so we go out. And I go and drop a few F-bombs, and I say a few things that, aren't, that are off color. And I did well. And then mind you, this is, this is outside of Reno. It's a fucking geriatrics clinic. It's like... Everybody in this whole room is above 50 years old, and most of them are closer to 80. And so it's all these old people in the front are people in wheelchairs. So it was this comedy show or, or watching um, Joe Kenda. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Okay. So think of that situation, and it's huge. Man, this place is packed. I mean, this guy has I miss to, Matlock for this. This guy has to be... <laughs> This guy has to be making tons of money. All, and, all promoters do. And so so I go up, I do the thing. Willie gets up. He starts doing his set, and he hasn't even cursed once. He gets about 10 minutes in. He's got the crowd right away. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Willie Barsena. One of the funniest people I've ever seen. And he's got the crowd right, right away, and they're loving him. And there's all these old... I just remember because I remember seeing a lady with her walker in front of her and her bo her husband was in a wheelchair. There's all these fucking blue hairs. And he goes, hey, you guys, they told me to be clean on this show, but I don't feel like I need to be clean. Like, do you guys mind if I say, like, fuck? And they're like, nah, say it. And he's like, you guys mind if I do dirty jokes? They're like, do them. And he goes, all right, do me a favor, you guys. You see that guy at the back of the... And we're just going to say the guy's... Uh, name is Dave. Dave. Dave Wallace. Dave Wallace. We'll say his name is Dave Wallace. <laughs> For whoever there's a Dave Wallace out there, I'm sorry, man. We don't mean you. But anyway, he goes, you see that guy back there? He's talking about the promoter. Perino. He goes, yeah. He goes, you see that guy in the Sears coat? And he did. He was wearing a Sears, Sears coat. coat. Oh, my God. He goes, that cheap Sears coat? He goes, tell him, fuck you, Dave. Fuck you, Dave. And the crowd Dave. turns around. Oh, all old these people. old people, bro. Fuck you, Dave. Imagine turning the, the, the wheelchair to go, fuck you, Dave. And then and then he continues to slay. And then every, like, he did a 60-minute set, and I would say every 15 minutes, he would go, let's hear it one more time. Fuck you, Dave. F you, Dave. And they would, like, yell it to the back of the theater. So, like, I make my way to the back near the end of the show, and Dave is smoldering. He's smoldering. Dude, he's 
so fired up. How did you feel going back after all this, back to Dave's condo? Would Dave's you condo of, was disgusting. Would you think about that in your head? I got to go back with this guy. Dude, I was like, and that was the thing, was like, I got to go back with this guy. And he goes, because he, right away he starts to blame me because he's like, you cuss, now Willie's up there cussing. <laughs> Let me tell you and, something, butch. And I was like, it's like you have no idea, bro. So the show ends, right? And and Willie's standing, shaking hands. He comes out, he's shaking hands, and Dave's standing on the other side of the hallway. And as Dave's standing on the hallway, all these old people, bro, are like putting their like bony fingers in his face, going "fuck you, Dave." Hilarious. Fuck you, Dave. They and he's part of the more show. And more worked up. And I can see the owner of this whole thing, bro. This guy owns this. He owns one in Golden, Colorado. He owns like four or five of them. This motherfucker owns the original Batmobile, and he has it in there. Okay? So that's how rich this dude is. So, like, so Dave starts to beeline it to Willie. And at the same time, I see the owner moving up to Willie. And Dave's about to go give Willie the business. And right when Dave starts to give Willie the business, the owner walks up and goes, that is the best comedy show I've ever seen in my life. Dude, I want you to, I want you to headline my Golden Colorado room. And he writes down his, like his phone number and he hands it to Willie. And he looks over at Dave and he goes, let's all go have a drink and talk about this. Willie lost that number, huh? I, he did. I took a picture of it and sent it to him. So he totally did. He didn't even remember that the guy offered it to him, bro. So we're all sitting at this table, right? And this guy's mad at me because I started cussing, and he hates Willie for the fuck you, Dave thing. And the guy loves uh, Willie, and he's just telling Dave, this is the best comic you've ever had. You should have more guys like this. And Dave's just waiting for fucking the owner to leave so he can fucking rip Willie's head off. But then at, 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 like at the end when he goes, you know what, I got to get out of here, you guys. Hey, Willie, what room are you staying in? And he goes, blah, blah. And he goes, give that room to Butch. Because Butch, you don't have a room. You're staying with, with Dave. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, give that room to Butch. And he goes, and then he calls this lady over, this assistant. He goes, give Willie the presidential suite and, and, uh, and make sure he has everything set up for him. And he takes off. And then the lady takes off. And Dave's just sitting there like doesn't know what to do now. Fuming, huh? Fuming. <laughs> doesn't know what to do. And, and then and he starts to grumble. And like the lady brother, comes brother, over brother. with the card key and all these like beautiful, like like there's a bottle of champagne and a basket and shit. And uh and she goes, Here's your room, have a nice time. And then she goes, and then Willie looks over at me and he goes, Butch, you don't want to stay in the room with this guy. And I'm like, no, I'll take your room, Willie. You said, fuck Dave, yeah. Fuck <laughs> Not yet. And he goes, You know what, bro? I don't need that big old room. And I got all my stuff set up in my room already. And he goes, and like, and Dave's like, all right, you're going to give me the suite? And Willie hands me the key to the suite and hands me the basket of goodies. <laughs> and fucking Dave loses it, bro. He loses it. And after that, he never talked to me again for like years. And that's how you not get booked again. That's how you not get booked again. With style, though. With style. That is one of my, and but that happens all, and that happened all the time back then. But back then, I think it was more detrimental because, like, that was your career, and there was only so many people who ran theaters back then. And that was the thing with Keith Alby, um, not Keith Alby, uh, the Keith Alby circuit was that um, if you were to do dirty work and then you were to to uh, say something bad about Keith Alby then you wouldn't work for them again. If you even got, like, because entertain, what's the Entertainment Weekly magazine? Alley Weekly? No, it was like an entertainment magazine back then. Um, the, the, the Daily, the Hollywood Reporter? Uh, the, something like that. But the, if it, but it was a magazine. Drama log. It was a magazine that would always kind of bash on the Keith Alby circuit. Yeah. If you were found with that on your person, Keith Alby would fire you. So that's how serious they were back then. And I mean, promoters still do that shit. I mean, there's constantly some guy out there that's like, if you work with this guy, you'll never fucking work for me again. You know, if you if you do this, then, you you know, we had a guy in the Bay Area that was like, if all of you guys fuck with this guy, then nobody gets to, to anybody does comedy with this guy, then nobody's going to get to work at my theater. And it's like, 
I, I, I hate when promoters, they try to like vent on you about what the last comedian did that was so horrible. Like, I'm like, I, I don't care. Right. You just give me ideas of what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. So he got, like, I always want to tell them, so he got away with it now. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what are you telling me? You didn't catch him. You didn't, yeah. I, remember, I was working with a promoter out of, um, over there, um, Northern California. And he hired me, go. Oh, I booked this guy last time, man. He went to go do a meeting greet at another town. <laughs> he told me that he had to leave early. He said he booked this comedian to do a comedy show. Right. That started at around 8. Okay. That did exactly with his time with the other comic. Uh-huh. And then boned out, bro. And did another show on the other part yeah, of the Yeah, he town. went to like Fresno to do like a club. For another five G's just to walk around for thirty minutes. So okay, but what's the problem with that with Ex- this guy? I'm telling exactly. I'm not the promoter, right? But I mean, what's the pro- what's the promoter's problem with that though? I don't understand. When, when I a promoter is telling out his market? when a promoter was telling me this, I, I, I was telling you. So you're telling me that there was a club that wanted me to walk around for five G's? <laughs> like like okay, can you give me their number? So I can call them up? Because that's how I think, too, when someone's like, I can't Because believe- I'm not going to bash the other comic. He's slick. Right. He's getting his money. Like, I know comics, you know, like um, Michael Blackson. Okay. And then I don't know if comics did this back then. I believe you get shot by the mob doing this. Cause, like, he'll do his his show, and then Michael Blackson go do a meeting at, a, at an after party somewhere else. Oh. And Russell Peters... He'll go. He'll he'll take his DJs, right? And they'll have they'll DJ a party at a so, Russell Peter works, and then those two DJs DJ, and then like sometimes I was working with him after the show, we'll go to a club, and then that her, his DJs are booked at that club too because they're big enough, they're known, right? And they get paid for that club too. And then the promoter the promoter can't say nothing. The promoter can't say anything. Yeah, we sold out that but theater. But see, here's the thing, though. He sold out the theater. I don't understand the problem because it's like it's not like he's going and doing comedy somewhere else. He's just going and walking around. And he's right. not DJing, right? He's not even DJing, bro. If, if I knew how to DJ, you'd be you'd be seeing me out there in the clubs DJing too. <laughs> I totally would. If I knew I'll how mix to do... for one hour for an extra ten G's. If I knew how to do anything outside of stand up comedy, I would be doing it actually. Like if somebody would tell me, Felipe, do you still do magic? I thought you never asked. <laughs> Hold on, bro. Let me take let me go get my can rabbits. We do that? Let me go get slippers. Can we can we do that? Can we like secretly train you to do magic? And then like like we go do a set in like Miami, and then you drive across town and you do a magic show <laughs> at like the library or something. I don't think I'll ever do magic, bro. I have fat, clumsy ass fingers, bro. What happened to the rabbit? Oh, I broke his ear. <laughs> Was that supposed to be a rabbit? So, so we're talking about how now theaters have left, clubs have taken over, but clubs are run by the mob. Um, comics kind of have to like be a little careful, and, and then the mob, they know that they gotta sell alcohol, and the mob has contacts on alcohol licenses. They have a lockdown in licenses. Right. And I remember when um, I went to um, I went to Aspen, and I did a show with comedian David Brenner, and he he used to host the Tonight Show. Okay. Bro, when I saw David Brenner the first time, I thought he was Native American. Really? I thought he was Native American, bro. <laughs> Why? He's dark. Because he's dark. Yeah, and he has, like, his face, like, the way his face is shaped, dude, he looks like a Native American. He looks like a Native. Yeah, like, ha, 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 la. <laughs> you know, and um, so he picked me out out of a bunch of comics to go do a show with him. Okay. And he goes up there with a newspaper, bro, like Mort Saul style. Really? And does his bit, kills it. No shit. And um, we're all chilling, you know, eating food. And he starts talking about comedy. And, I, you know, me, I start asking him questions about the improv. And my manager at the time, he asked him, and I asked him too. And he goes, is that true that, that um, 
Bud Freeman will stop you from going into the green room, going into the showroom with your soda. He goes, oh, what happened was the sodas were a two a do, two dollars in the showroom. Okay. And in the bar, they were dollar seventy five. So I would order all my drinks at the bar. I didn't walk into the showroom. And Bud Friedman so caught the one, on to that. The one brief Bud Friedman caught on and he put his leg out one day. <laughs> and he goes, and he looked at me and said, I've been seeing you doing that for a couple of times, but today you owe me a quarter. Get the fuck out of here. What year is this? 60s, dog. 60s when um, I think the, the improv opened in 63 or 73. So a quarter at that time is like a buck now. I bet. That's like me, but it's still a buck is in shit. That's like, dude, that's crazy to be like, hey, man, you owe me a buck for not for, for buying that in there instead of out here. I remember in the 80s, I was, I was in high school, but when I started comedy in the 90s, mm-hmm. I, I used to notice that um, a lot of the food was named after the, the comedian. Like if it was nachos, it was called Pablo Francisco's Nachos. Get out of here. Yeah. At, the, uh, at the comedy store? Yes. No, not the comedy store. Some comedy club I would go to. Oh, the to. comedy club. At the comedy strip in El Paso when they oh, have food. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They still have some of those yeah, out there. Yeah, Irish George Lopez potatoes. Yeah, George Lopez has never been there, by the way. Yeah. Either, probably. And I always thought that the the, the Ha Cafe in the beginning, other menus were named after comics. And I always thought, oh, fuck that, man. I hope they never named me after anything. <laughs> it's so hacky. You don't want to be the Felipe Esparza hash. I don't want to go. I want to. I don't want to be a. a, a, a back then, I wasn't that. I felt like I wasn't funny, and I didn't have confidence. Right. So I felt like, oh man, I would hate to bomb, and then a the person said, not only did he suck, but the nacho named after him sucked even worse. <laughs> <laughs> like God forbid you sucked and the food named after you sucked as well. That's funny. Um What happened to you? Oh man, I was I was fucking the fucking Fred Stoller soup was cold. <laughs> and then I and then somebody and that's something that'll keep Fred Stoller up all night. <laughs> Fred Stoller's tripping somewhere right Bro, now. Bro, he'll go call the people, I made more soup. He'll show with a with a pot. <laughs> Ah, that's fucking hilarious. So, I don't know. We t- uh, we talked about this the last time, but um, back then you would have to audition for these clubs. Like it would it would be in the daytime while while a guy was mopping, right? And then the club owner, which 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 the gangster, he's there with his goons, you know, and they're they probably been up all night, and you gotta perform in front of them. Have you ever had to audition? Yeah, for like, last like comic that, standing. That fashion? Last comic standing. Last comic standing. It was just me, um, Natasha Leggero, um, Andy Kindler, and Greg Geraldo. Geraldo. No way. And I did three minutes with no audience, but me, I've been like looking for me, and this is for you comedians who are listening right now. Okay. Who are afraid when you show up to do a small room. You show up to a room that normally seats 80, but now there's only 20, and they're all scattered. Or there's 15 people they're there. They're sparsed out. Don't ever, you got to walk into that show and know in your head that there are only seven. And don't think about the, there was supposed to be 200, because that's besides the fact. It ain't right. 200 no more. Today is Monday, bro. There's seven people. You got to make those people laugh yes. no matter what. So you gotta get in the in your headspace that I gotta make these seven people laugh. I had an audition with AGT one time, and I wasn't expecting it to so, be three people like that. So knowing that I what an empty room feels like, I knew that these three comedians are judges, and they're gonna they're not gonna laugh. They're gonna be hard on me. But I said, if I hear the cameraman breathe when I'm talking, if I see the sound guy over there. Move around when I'm talking. I'm killing. You're killing it. Yeah. So I was playing to them, you know, right. and I knew like I was going like this. Hey, all right. I was going like that. And I was reacting to their laugh that they were like whatever. Right. And um, and that's the way I performed it, and that's the way you're supposed to perform a a seven room theater. 
you play to those seven people. Right. You don't worry about the other people that aren't there. They ain't there no more. They're not there, and they're not going to be there. So you worry about who's in front of you. And don't ever say, man, when somebody walks up, don't ever make excuses for not being funny in front of seven people. Don't ever say there was no audience. Because if you can't make seven people laugh, how are you going to make 700? Right. And you should have already made seven people laugh, which is why you got there, because seven people at least should have told you you should do comedy. That's, that's a good advice for somebody that shows that's up complaining advice. and go, wait a minute, there's only 20 people there. You never made 20 people laugh? I had a show in my first or second year. I did this place called the Britannia Arms. It was like... Sounds a, bad already. And it was two people. It was two people and the bartender. Sound like it's being run by somebody that loves somebody in armpits. I smashed a chair two people because no yeah right i smashed the two people because the one dude was drunk and i just kept fucking making fun of him and it was keeping those two people laughing and and this i'm new like i'm i'm new and i've never even actually did well before but because i could keep those two people laughing i survived that i felt like i survived that that horrendous seven minute set Sometimes, man, you got to follow those two people to the bathroom when they go to the bathroom. They're right. <laughs> you got to be, hey, man, where are you going, bro? Are you going to take a shit? Oh, man, I thought you were leaving me. <laughs> no, I, I love you, man. All right, we're going to wait for you to come back. We're going to pause. What do you think? So what do you think it was like back then when you go into this huge theater and there's like five, six people? And I even think back in the end of the, like, Keith Albee circuit, like, Big Fox theaters... It was like free tickets, and then it was free coffee for homeless people. And that's how those kind of died out, were just really sad relics where people would just come in, and you got these comics that were like really popular on radio performing in front of like hey, six homeless guys. It's funny how all these, even though they moved the, the, all these theaters, they stopped doing comedy, they stopped doing vaudeville, but they didn't cl shut down. No. They became movie theaters. That's right. Well, I mean, um, like the, like San, the San Jose, San Jose Improv, and it was a movie theater all the way up until I was like a kid. There, I remember we used to, uh, we we I used to think it was like someone would like say floating popcorn because you would throw popcorn on the floor and the rats would pick it up, and all you could see was the popcorn like crawling around. Now that theater's beautiful again, and it's restored. But yeah, that was an original theater. Charlie Chaplin performed at that theater. Crazy yeah. man. So. So all these theaters are are pretty much done for comedy, you know. They're they're um, they bo they're booming in um, talkies. They call them movies, right? And um, oh, these that's right, they did call them talkies. And then prohibition comes, and uh, the 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 clubs are being run by these gangsters. And um, what happened was, the Friars Club was was um, infiltrated by some mobsters. Yes. And um, all these comics like Chico Marx. Steve Allen and some other comics, they were playing poker and the mob was robbing them for years. For years. That's right. It wasn't until they went on they went on under investigation. They were all embarrassed. They were robbing the game the entire time. And remember that one time they tried to cancel that those two comics for buying that jewelry? Yeah, it was um uh, Milton Burl. They no, they yeah, they tried to cancel them because they got arrested. And they threw everything at Who them, was huh? That? It was Milton Berle and... Steve Allen, no? It was Steve Allen. And... They Mil showed him the ring. They, sh they showed him Steve that Allen's ring. Steve Allen's wife had the ring. They showed him the ring, and he wanted to buy it off the table, and then that one gangster said, I could get you another one. For the, and okay. Were, and what happened was that guy, the, the people, the, the, the woman that ratted him out was a, 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 a maid... Who are the Nazi sympathizer in, in America? That's right. That's such a crazy story. It's crazy, huh? And they ended up how, going to jail for it. How it went? Minute. How it went that far? It went super far. And it was before America was killing Nazis. That's the thing is because I know that me and you grew up with Milton Berle as an old man, George Burns as an old man. I never in a million years thought that these guys were like wrapped up in the mob, dealing with mob dealings, like. But they had. I don't know that fool had a big penis. Supposedly. Oh yeah, Milton Berle also had like this massive penis that everybody would joke about constantly. They said that um, one time he was in he was in a, a a dick contest to see which one is longer, and um, the guy <laughs> put his penis out, and somebody looked at Milton Berle and said, "Just take out enough to win." 
That <laughs> That's how big it was. I've okay, so there I also <laughs> heard that there were contests to not contests, but like all the roasts were about his penis. All the roasts were about his penis, and it was more or less a competition to see who could tell the best Milton Berle there dick was, joke. There was this writer, I, I, I don't know his name, but this guy would write for all those um, Martin, the Dean Martin roasts. Yeah. And he would write um, jokes to, for, for comics to say about Milton Berle, about his penis, and about his life and all that. But this writer never met Milton Berle. So one day he meets Milton Berle, and he's, all old now with a bunch of cake makeup, trying to be young, you know. And he said, I wrote so many jokes about you, about your long penis. And Milton girls, Milton Burr looked at him, but you've never seen it, huh? Would you like to see it? And what happened? And he said, he pulled out this fucking anaconda no with the size way. of a cobra head, bro. So he, and th he's already old by now. And he just pulls out this old. Full of tobacco juice and shit. <laughs> Listen to this is something very important, man. That I learned about that in the history of comedy, that all these all these comics, Milton Burrow, yeah, um, um, what's his name, um, Bob Hope, they were all clean comics, adored by America, but times were changing, man. The sixties were coming, right? People were not wearing. Um, there were people like Morton Saw, Lenny Bruce, not wearing suits. On stage, right, and pretty much doing traditional stand-up comedy, and, and where you didn't really care about talking. So here's Bob Hope, loved by America, did movies, blah blah blah, a funny stand-up, but now he he, he went to um, he went to, he he went to go perform. He instead of working the road, Bob Hope said, "Forget it, I'm gonna do the military." So he goes to do the military shows with fucking. All these celebrities making tons of money over there, supporting the troops, World War II, Korean War, Filipino War, but now it's Vietnam. And you think these kids are like, it's like me speaking to millennial kids. Right. This is like Mi the 60s, right? The 60s. The 60s. It's, it's there's millennials who are younger than me, but I'm trying to appear to their kids. And, and this is an era after we're okay with World War II. And there's now another war winding up. This is a Vietnam War. We're not okay with this war. And a, a, a Vietnam War, not a friendly war. And now he's being booed by the young soldiers. Yes. They're not down for that. Well, because he's doing very pro-Nixon. Pro-Nixon. Like, pro and, like, he, and he don't know shit about marijuana. Right. But he's talking about he's hallucinating with it. Right. He's not, he's not catching up with the times, you and know? He's like, you boys are out here. And as a comic, you got to yeah. keep changing with the times. So... People like Lenny Bruce, you know, passing this fool up, huh? Right. And that's the thing, too, man, is that they're, they're passing him up because he can't stick with the times. And, and again, this is a part of... So, like, nowadays, when, when you look at an old guy like Bob Hope, he could survive in comedy. Because now we know that comedy evolves. You have to evolve with it. You have to push with it. But back then, you know, comedy's very young. And comedy actually now is very young. Um, stand-up comedy itself is very young, so there's no real way to to to, and and the country's very divided. Stand-up comedy is very anti-establishment. Right. Bottom line. Right. You come part of the establishment, you're gonna lose the audience. But it wasn't always. And is it fair to say? Because I mean, because original comedy is, you know, the poor people getting over on the rich. Yes. That's the way it was funny. Like British humor, it's always funny because. They don't have to use black people or Mexicans or Chinese people for the joke because it's a well, class. It, it's a they class. It. Right, yeah. It's class. it's class. So they make fun of poor people. They make fun of the rich and the poor. You know what I mean? So if you're like more connected to the rich now, how are you going to be funny? Right. Right. And that was. Because he didn't want to disrespect. He didn't want to disrespect Nixon. He didn't want to disrespect all these other presidents that the newer comedians were doing. But comedy also is taking on a different tone because, like, during Bob Hope's time and... Um, it was the American Pearl, dream. Everybody well, had homes. Well, a lot of it was, like, did you hear about the fella that blah, blah, blah? Did you hear about the fella that blah, blah, blah? And as we're moving into this new club comedy era, it's no longer did you hear about the guy with his wife who fucking blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's now, like... 
I am. This is happens to me. I'm going through this. More relatable. It's more relatable, and we're we're learning that com- that people are coming out to be to to relate to you. A good example is this. There was a joke that did that people said back then. There was a man from Nantucket that got changed to. I was in Nantucket, and yes, <laughs> that's a very perfect example. Of like, I was in Nantucket getting my dick sucked, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There, or there was a man from Nantucket who got r- crabbies, you know? Right. But now you change it to, I was in Nantucket, and it's a dirty town. Yes. And that's so, and that's the difference. That's, that's when where you it evolve. starts to break. And that's where it starts to that's, super evolve. Isn't it how you go from caveman to fucking uh, stand up erectus on that joke easily, huh? Easily. Easily. It's like when you try to stand up like erectus. I love that. It's like when you try to tell a stand up. Comic in the beginning, you know, and it's so hard. And I, and I, and I, I stopped doing it. Like, I would tell comedians, you know, like who are working with me, they would ask, Where are the single ladies at? No, bro. You say, I love single ladies and get to the joke. Right. You don't got to ask no more. You don't have you, to ask. That's, that's caveman comedy, bro. Yeah. Your stand up erect is now. I actually heard somewhat similar where I was, um, a buddy of mine, Trenton Davis. Shout out to my boy was giving um, was giving advice to a young black comic, and he goes, "Stop telling them you're black. They know you're black." As a black man, right? Exactly. And so you switch that, and that's the difference, man. And really, that's that. You're like what you're talking about is like, you know, again, comic erectus. Like we're now getting into a new era, and and with comedy, man, I can tell you right now, and um, I know you've experienced this. Comedy changes every fucking day. It moves fast. It's not like music. It's not like acting where it evolves slowly. It evolves quickly because it has a lot to do with how we live our lives from day to day. And so now we're seeing club comedy yes. at this time. And I don't know. We talked about this in the last episode, of one of the episodes, that um, stand-up comedy in general changed dramatically after World War II. Yes. Because before... It wasn't like white power, white power. You know, there was segregation, sure, but it, it was not like open. You know, like we're, we're not throwing it out there in, in people's faces. But when Germany started attacking and started claiming the Aryan nation and white first purity, it, it was harder for a white comic to do jokes about black people now. Yeah, it was harder for a that black, very true. Yeah, a black I mean, people it, to say for a white comic to say. Um, two drunk Irish men came in and met up with a stuck-up German guy. No, yeah, because the world's fed up with racism. At this you point. can't even say that no more. You will have to change the names. It's weird to say that as we're sitting in this world right now, the way it is. But it is very true that at that and some come and want to go back to 1940. Yes, now yeah, but at that time, like the the the, the world was sick of racism. It's disgusted with what Hitler's doing. Also, the youth, you know, youth runs everything, man. Even like now as we're older men doing comedy, I always talk about newer subjects. I always talk about contemporary things because that's who's going to buy my albums. That's who's going to buy my stuff. And so now we're in like the late 50s, early 60s. We're looking at beatniks. You know, this is like the precept to hippies and and stuff like that. Yeah, there are these guys that wear black. and You got Jared Kerouac. You know where they do this? Why? Because they used to perform in the bottom of basements and the show was more diverse with blacks and whites doing poetry and, and stand up stand-up shows that were um, very undercover that they couldn't clap out loud because people upstairs would hear it. So just do this. Oh, clap. so it was in, in a way it was like a speakeasy still. It was a, an applause. Wow. So this was a... Because I see Unless that... Unless you to hurry up. I see people do that sometimes when I'm like... Like, like when I'm like doing well... You'll see someone in the audience go like that. Yeah, and I'm like, what the loud. fuck is that, dude? He has one hand. Because they're probably used to doing, like, being yeah. at, like, like uh, poetry yeah. slams or something <laughs> like that. So, yeah. So, you have this era. You have this people, this counterculture that's changing. Jack Kerouac on the road. You know, you got William S. Burroughs. You have this Gonzo riding stuff happening. And, and Mort kid, Saul. Kids are changing. So, you have Mort Saul. You have Lenny Bruce. You have Soupy Lenny, Sales. You have Lenny Bruce that's talking about race, but not in the same way that Bob Hope was talking about race or or Milton Berle. He's talking about racism in America. And he's, he's talking and about he's, injustice. And he's calling people out like, 
on that one album when he said that um, he went to this club one time and it was a, it was a, a regular club. And then he went back to the club, and now the club is like a gay club, but the promoter's still there. Right. And the owner's still there. What happened? He goes, oh, man, this club got taken over by cocksuckers. <laughs> what are you talking about, cocksuckers? Yeah. So that's, and that, by at women? that time, but at that time, yeah. though, that's Nobody very, was saying cocksucker. No, you can't curse on stage. You can't curse in public. Um, you could get arrested. You could get taken to jail. And ultimately, that's what killed Lenny Bruce. Was that I, I got a lot of you know what man? Because this day and age, right now, um, you know, I've always had respect for Lenny Bruce, and you go back and forth on what Lenny Bruce did and said, and and nowadays, some sensitive people might be like, well, you know, like it wasn't that great. But I, I you got to give it to someone at a time when you could buy cops off with the amount of money that Lenny Bruce was making, and he didn't want to pay, and he didn't want to pay. So he was constantly getting arrested. He was constantly getting put in jail. And at some point, like, he, like, like for long terms, like he's looking at long term sentences. So this man eventually dies with drugs and stuff like that. But from what I read and I looked through, it was uh, law enforcement in pushing on him for cursing. He was the arrested place. right here by the, on the trooper door by, um, by what's his name? Um. Chief Daryl Gates, when he was a police That's officer. That's right. He did go after him. And he was constantly getting arrested in Chicago. He he was wanted. He couldn't live in Chicago. And then he moved to Florida. At the, at the same time that um, Br Lenny Bruce was being um, arrested, there was, a, there was a bunch of comedians out there that were also dirty and getting away with it, like Richard Pryor. Yes. And um, everybody from the Chitlin circuit. It's funny, man, how all these guys... Like had those names like Parker Carcass, who went who ended up dying, you know. Right. And then like there were those black guys with those weird names, like uh, Amos and Andy. Amos and Andy. Yeah. Yeah, there was a, oh um, well, I mean there was like a lot of like a lot of nicknames and there was a lot of extravagance because there wasn't a lot like like nowadays you go well I want to see Felipe Esparza well who's Felipe let me watch this clip and so. You know, they had to have these huge names and they had to put the posters up and they had to have all these like, you know, it looked like you were going to go see a big show. So a nickname was like really important back then where I don't talent. I don't know if it's as, I don't know if it's as important now. It's funny, man. You can't have a name called crowd pleaser and then go up on stage. There ain't no crowd. The, that's the thing is is that you gotta live up to that name man you have to live up to that name and i, I has cedric ever always entertained was he cedric the entertainer before he was the inter like entertaining people that's the questions that i have i read that um he got cedric entertainer because when he went up on stage one time he goes where's the host you the host who's the he goes, you the host you and the, the headliner. You're the headliner. And then like they asked the wall, don't you have singers here? No, nah, you could do all that. Oh, so I'm just said to the entertainer tonight. <laughs> and then that's how it came yeah. out. No way. Yeah. That's fucking see, that's how you come up with a nickname, bro. You can't be like fucking He earned it that night. Can't take it away. Can never kills it Simmons. Can never take it away from him. No, he earned it that night. But if I come in and I go, What's your name? Butch, Butch the King of Kill. Butch the King of Kill Escobar. What are you, a fucking a Viking or what? <laughs> Some might think. <laughs> Some might actually assume that. Um, but yeah, you got to live up to that name. So, I mean, eventually I think it stopped. I think the, I think the whole showmanship behind... I wonder if coming back then can pick their audience like they do now. Like a, a, like a white comic walking into a place... That's kind of like half trailer trash, half Mexican, half black, and he walks away, walks out of the room and goes, "You know, I'm more of a cerebral comic." No, not back then. I don't think back then, bro, that. people wanted to make people laugh. I think laugh. you could say, "Hey, I'm a black comic," because there was still a separation. That's true. You know, and um, and and that and yeah, we have, we have the Chitlin Circuit. For that's you. something we're gonna get into soon because um, I think black comedy deserves its own uh. Its own box right now, bro. I know we talked about the, the last time, but goddamn, I, I kept thinking about um, pro promoters not paying the comedian, and then they get arrested for uh, being a vagrant. 
because they're vagrant laws now. And the promoter they didn't give you a room, so you're walking down the street with no money. Mm-hmm. And you can't tell that you can't tell that what happened to you. Oh man, Leonard didn't pay me. Well, Jay Leno got arrested for vacancies. Yeah, got found sleeping in the dumpster behind the uh, comedy store. Damn. And and this was like seventies. Vagrancy was like all the way up until the seventies, eighties, probably till Reagan made everybody a permanent vagrant uh, when he closed down the like crazy hospitals or whatever. So, because there was no homeless like that before, so you could get arrested for vagrancy, and and if you had to go do a show in Albuquerque and there's no planes and you got to take a train and you get to Albuquerque and you're doing a show there. And then they're like, all right, here's your money. Good night. Have a good evening. And it's not even enough to get a Yeah, home. man. Trap, the train, airplanes, automobiles, and buses made it much easier for a comedian to perform, man. It wasn't like back in the day. I want to book you for a show. Where could you get there? Eight months. So when you first started, and then, and again, you could correlate to now. I mean, we you fly now. And I say we because I get to yeah. fly with you. But... Do you remember buses? Do you remember? Yeah, my, I, I took a bus my first time. Um, I was hanging outside of a, a restaurant, and Joey Medina got a call from Bart Reed from the El Paso comic strip, and he goes, "You know anybody that wants to open this week?" And um, he goes, "Felipe, you want to open at the comic strip?" Hell yeah, bro! Give me right to the Greyhound station. Like that. And then seventeen hours later, bro, I was in. I was at the at the El Paso, Paso comic strip. Feature opening. What's the furthest you went on a bus? That's the furthest. That's the furthest. 17 and a half hours. Wouldn't go farther than that. And then uh, how long did that last? How long were you driving around in a bus or in a car? That was the only time I took a bus to a gate with an El Paso. Okay. And another time I didn't have no car. I took a bus to Las Vegas. But the whole time I was there, I was calling people, bro, you want to hang out in Vegas? Meet me. Meet me at the next bus stop. What up? Come, hey, what's up? You want to go to Vegas? Hell nobody, yeah. Nobody, bro. Nobody. You got a car? <laughs> nobody. Meet me there. Nobody. Meet me there. Nothing. Meet me there, man. And then um, the 70s came, man. And um, television and the Tonight Show. Yes, you have. So, so, so now we're transitioning out of clubs. We're transitioning out of radio at the same time. Radio had a really short but illustrious um, presence, and and then TV comes along. I don't know if we talk about this the last time, but uh-huh. Eddie Cantor was like the first, the first stand-up comedian to have a television show, and America loved him like they loved him. Right. But he was also like a womanizer, like he would be in a set and he'll pinch women's ass, and then if you said something, he'll get you fired. He fired that one lady who, like, in that story. Because he um he squeezed her butt during the take. And she goes, Mr. Cantor. Mr. Cantor. And he fired that bitch. Fired that bitch. Yeah, dude. Because there, there was, was no rules back then. Bro, sexual harassment in a job place did not appear in a law till 1978. Is that real? Yeah. Wow. So all those years before then, and then probably... You. Bro, back then, you could just walk up to a, 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 a female, hump her, and go, have a nice day, Judy. And then nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing. Wow. And so Eddie Cantor's going around grabbing asses. So I don't know what to tell about the good old days. I don't know, man. You know, Hollywood's messed up now, but I wonder what it was like before there were, like, uh, Bro, before scandals, back, like, before all that and stuff. Before, you were held down. It was like um, when you sign a movie contract in the twenties, in the in the in the tens, in the thirties. It was like signing to a a baseball league, a baseball team. Like you, you didn't just sign up for one movie. We sign you for ten years, whether we're doing movies or not. That's how they ran the contracts too for the theaters. That was that was for the movies too. Like yeah. like Addy Far- Fatty Arbuckle, he was the first stand up. Comedian and comedian actor to earn a million dollars per movie. And then we're talking directing, writing, starring, and shooting the movie. And him getting a whole million dollars. He wrote, directed, starred in it, shot it. Yeah. Produ- Did he produce it as well? Yeah. I'm assuming he produced For it. For Warner Brothers. Jesus Christ. And um, he was the first comedian to get canceled. How did he get canceled? Um... 
he a woman he was partying in San Francisco and somebody That's shoved a, a a bottle up a woman's crotch and killed her with it. Oh and, yes. And he was left there standing. Okay, so they suspected him of doing that? Yo, know, he was he was um I've heard about this. He was, I have heard he about was this. accused by the by the by that um accused by the public. What is that word called when um when you're guilty, you're guilty by public, whatever. Oh, by the um, yeah, yeah, the eyes of the public, he was shot. He was um, done by the media because um, Paramount or whoever he was contracted with was real good friends. In with, the court of public opinion. Yeah. Yes. So the Paramount was really, really good friends with um, the Herald Examiner. Okay. And the Herald Examiner was a, a, a newspaper that competed with LA Times. And they wrote a whole spiel about the case that he was, the whole thing, without even going to court, they were saying he was guilty. So it was a spill campaign against him. Spear, smear campaign. Smear campaign. And he never really recovered. A spear campaign sounds good. Anyways, he, like at, at the, long story short, innocent. He was found innocent, but he couldn't go back to work ever again. And he ended up writing and directing under a under um, false name. Fatty Arbuckle did. Yeah, and um, he will he will he will write for movies, and then other people will claim for it and give him a little cheese. So cancel culture existed at that time as well. Yeah, and he was he was um he was a heroin addict also. Pretty serious cancel culture. And on, on the book I read. It said that um, the reason they did that to him because he wanted to step out of his contract with the studio and do his own thing. Wow! So if he's making a million, if you're giving him a million dollars in the 1920s, bro, how much do you think the studio's making? Way more than that. They're getting all the ticket sales from Especially all these when theaters. There's no, like they're like now we have like regulation. Yeah. We supposedly have regulation. So but back then there was no regulation. He's the one, and supposedly he when uh, when he met Charlie Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin didn't have any shoes, and Fatty Arbuckle gave him gave him his shoes, and he said put these on, and and Charlie Cha Chaplin put on, um he put the Fatty Arbuckle's shoes, uh, backwards. So the right foot became the left, and the left foot became the right. That's why Charlie Chaplin's feet look like that. That's why he would walk like that. Yeah. Nice. And Fatty Arbuckle. This taught. is the kind of shit we're looking for here. And, and on Fatty Hitler Arbuckle Fools. was really tight with Buster Keaton. Okay. And he—he's the one that threw him a bone in the beginning when he was a young actor. Right. Wow. And Fatty Arbuckle ended up dying, and Odin over here in Los Angeles by John. By Adam Street, he, there's a his house became a rehab now. It's called the House of Wahulu or Wahila, something like that. That's a rehab now. Not even anything has to do with Fatty Arbuckle, but it's his old house. Yeah, I wonder if we can get a picture of that. Yeah, man, but but that's crazy, dude. How um how when one move when uh, movies came, Fatty Arbuckle, Charlie Chaplin they didn't have to perform in these vaudeville theaters no more. Right. But, right. but people always, people like us, you know, a lot of people think that we're going to get ahead of the game. No, man. The game is always ahead of us. Always ahead of us. Always we're ahead think, of us. Because we're thinking right now, like back then, people are probably thinking, oh, no, vaudeville is done. No. No. Here comes talkies. Where are we going to show them at? Right. Who has a big theater? Right. He does. All the Fox theaters. Other Fox Studio, other Fox theaters became Fox Studios. Other Fox theaters became Fox Studios. So all the other movies that were on Fox, that was a movie made by Fox, were shown at Fox theaters. Oh wow! That's the monopoly. Well, and you also can see, you know, one of the things that I've all, all I noted in doing all all this research and stuff was like, you p actually pointed this out to me, because um, we both read. Uh, a little excerpt about one of the more popular things that was happening during the vaudeville days is that when someone would get on stage, put a phonograph on, put a record on, and lip sync to the record. And we both kind of went, that's stupid. But then we realized right now, you Jerry pointed Lewis. out. But you, yeah, right. But you pointed out when we were having that conversation that happens on, that's TikTok now. It's TikTok now. Yeah. That's ex and that's how exactly. TikTok started. Andy Kaufman, bro, here I come to save, save the day. day. Yeah, that's TikTok. That's TikTok now, and that's the thing is that the game's always going to be ahead of you. Yeah, and you think that like 
and then people, I hope anybody listening to this, you know, don't think that, oh, man, I, mean, I can never compete with this. No, but you just do your own thing. Right. But uh, it just, it's just a different format now because you're right about the, 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 the guy singing over the record and performing. People thought it was cheesy then. Right. People think it's cheesy now. People think it's cheesy now, but people still go to watch it. Are people, like, now we scroll to watch it. You know, but that's what's amazing, man, is like, as I've done comedy, I remember, so, you know, we were talking about TV. What came after TV? I would, I don't know, the internet. Internet. And, and then you have YouTube. And right now we're looking at YouTube. And then from YouTube, it was like Vine and then TikTok, right? So we're looking at that trajectory. We're looking at Instagram. And, and, and it's like, well, how is this relatable? One of the things that you're seeing a lot of right now on TikTok is, is clips, posts. Comics putting up their clips on TikTok to get more views, to get more people to watch them. And this is exactly what we're talking about here. Is like there's always going to be something new. Probably during the radio days, people there were guys that were like, oh, you because I remember when I started doing YouTube, <laughs> comics would be like, I remember walking into a room one night, into a green room, and I was I was the only guy doing YouTube um, as a comedian in my area. And they go, Oh, here comes Mr. YouTube. And I now that I think about that, I wonder if like a comic showed up in a green room at a radio station. They're like, "Oh, here comes Mr. TV. How you? How's that TV thing going for you, buddy? You dumb fuck." Oh, it's funny how he had to go on radio to promote his TV show. Oh yeah, how's that working? Exactly, exactly, dude. And that's exactly how comics would say that shit to each other. <laughs> that's how they would hate on each other. Like, fucking Felipe, dude, with his stupid TV shit. Oh, TV's so good for you. Come over to radio to promote for your TV show. Oh, yeah. Show. He has to go on my podcast to promote the HBO show. Yes, dude. Ex that's exactly the same shit. And that's what I... As I'm reading through all this stuff, as I'm reading Cliff's book, and I'm reading a couple other people's books, and I'm watching YouTube videos, you know, because I was really trying to do as much research for this first... Um, this like first subject that we're working on, I'm like, this is the same shit that happens to us now. And and in comedy it, in general, and stand up comedy, I mean, it's always trying to get the the joke out there fast enough with the least amount of words. And and, and these kids now, the new generation, they're doing that now without even thinking about it. They they got they could know, they know how to pan out a whole joke structure in a two minute clip. Or in a thirty-second right. clip, and and um, do you think that has to do with Twitter, or or, or Twitter or anything? But they're doing it now. But do and you think it has to do with Twitter because the short yeah. form is like the new introduction. But, but here. short form comedy is something that everybody has always wanted to do, right? Because if you go from the beginning of the first ever talkie, the first ever silent movie, okay, it was the movie, music, and then a title card, title card. Explaining what the movie is because it was before sound, and then action, and then another title card, and it wasn't until Buster Keating came, a comedian, who started showing the movie more with action, and he figured out we'll get more action in if we show less less title cards. So right there, it's shortening the joke by taking the fucking um. The title card out. You don't need to explain it no more. I think the genius. He's showing it in a video, and that's what these with Twitter and yeah. TikTok and all these short span videos is that these people learn how to do comedy in a short amount of time, and so it's, it's still safe comedy. To say that our society has always had an ADD. Yeah, we've always wrestled with it, bro. Com to, that's, why, yeah. that's why commercials have never been longer than thirty seconds. Because if it's longer than thirty seconds, we're gonna change the channel. That's why you always miss the beginning of the second half of Dukes of Hazards because your dad would change the channel. Piece the of shit. And he'd be like, Dad, go back, dude. It's going to start. And he'd be like, it's commercials. I know, man. I, I, I used to hate watching a television show and then you got to go back. <laughs> and you, and, 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 and I wanna, you want to choke your dad. Dad, I miss Wonder Woman doing her little spin. <laughs> I just wanted the spin, Dad. I miss Lynn. I miss Jamie Summers from Bionic Woman crushing a tennis ball. <laughs> I I I could sit through commercials. I never had a problem with that. Hell no, man. Sometimes I'm watching a video and if it has three commercials, I feel like the video's not worth it and I don't watch it. 
Really? Yeah. Right now, right because now. because YouTube's starting that new like because it's remember when YouTube just had one commercial, and now it, it went up to two commercials, and now it's getting up to like two commercials and a push ad. So it, it's starting to get in the way of like of of video watching for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, man. Also, I don't watch instructional videos either. No, at all. How? <laughs> <laughs> also, I don't read recipes no more because if you're going to show me how to cook, bake a cake, I don't want to know the history of why you like cakes, bitch. <laughs> Get to the ingredients. Show me an arrow that says, rush to the recipe. I don't want to know that your mom. Just get used, to the facts, I don't know the bitch. mom. I don't want to know that your mom used to pick strawberries <laughs> and, and Salinas and it's something your family <laughs> cherished forever. And the smell of strawberries remind you remind you of that December night when you guys were laying there in Salinas watching the gangs shoot each other off on Market Street. <laughs> Get to the recipe. And same thing, you know, as in stand-up comedy, as a young comic, if you're not famous, you need to get to that joke. Right. Nobody wants to hear you talking pontificate. Nobody wants long form. Nobody wants long Nobody form. Nobody long, long, long yeah. form, man. That's why people love deadpan comedians. People love one-liners, man. Also, man, if you're going to sit down and do, do comedy, make sure you have a good story to tell. Right, right. Good. Dude, that's the thing. Is I mean, you hear the phrase, that's a long way to go for a laugh. Because it's always too long to go for a laugh. They haven't heard that in a long time, bro. Yeah, I haven't heard that because I, I I remember doing a show one night, and I would have all these I had all these jokes I did all these long jokes, and this dude comes up to me and goes, "These people don't want to hear your fucking long ass stories, bro. Fucking cut it down to thirty seconds a joke. Nobody wants to hear the 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 lead up to what fucking happened." I remember one time the comedian was trying to pick up on another comedian lady. He goes, "The only fat in you." Or that guy's material. <laughs> I love shit like that, dude. I love shit like that. I love comedy beef. Bro, like people that. get mad. Like, if you were tell a young comedy, bro, you got to trim that fat. Right. What are you talking about? They don't know. They don't, like, that's the thing is a lot of people don't know what trimming the fat means. They should, imagine, that they, they, instead of having, like, the blue material, there should be a, a, a thing called where you trim people's fat off. The fat envelope. The fat envelope, bro. It weighs 10 fat pounds. Material. Oh, my God, man. Thank you very much for listening to us. Butch Escobar right here. He has a comedy Bible. He already threw it away. No, I got it right here with me, man. He didn't even open it once. I keep it with me all the time. I've had it on the road with us this whole time. Where can they follow you at? Follow me at Butch Escobar on Instagram. And then from there, there's a link tree that sends you to everywhere else. Follow me at... Funny Felipe on Twitter. I'm trying to build it. Hell yeah. Also, good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're at. Hit that music. <laughs>